God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Well, you all can just come on in. Let them know that the Brinson Institute is on the air. We're just excited again this week to be with you and share with you what God is doing in the land. I'm excited. This is another year, and no matter what is going on and what is happening to us, we must always know that God is in control. While I was uh, on my way over, I was just thinking, you know, God, what would you have me to share? Well, not you really the other day. What should I share? And as much as now we're on every week, amen. And one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that when we come on, we always have some information, something to excite you, to give you some insight, to challenge you. And uh, anytime you want to contact us, you can give us a call or go to our website and we'll be so happy to engage you. One of the things that I have been really looking at and listening to, even though I don't know whenever you may be watching me outside of today because our show is also continuously running, is that within a couple of weeks we will be celebrating for African Americans, we will be celebrating what we call the month of February. Uh, what we call Black History Celebration. And so as I began to think about that, because each ethnic group, the Hispanics and others, each ethnic group, they have a month of celebration. And these months of celebration purposely are designed to tell our children about our history, our struggles, our joys, and just to give us a perspective. You know, one of the things that the gospel says uh, to us, Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, to the nations. And sometimes some of the biblical texts go preach the gospel to every people. But one of the things that I think God is concerned about is nations, tongues, people, nations. So within nations comes culture. Within nations are geographical areas. And so what we have to understand in God's bouquet of humanity, there are nations, there are people, and there are tongues. Even in the Revelation it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord. Even during the Pentecost season or during uh, what we want to call, we always say we're apostolic. When the church was first formed in Acts, it says, and there were Jews from every nation under heaven. There were Jews gathered from every nation under heaven. So there was a variety of people and kindred from every nation tongue gathered in Jerusalem when the Holy Ghost came. Wasn't it something, isn't it something to know that God through his omnipresence, his omniscience and his uh, all omnipotence that he was concerned about telling the story that the new church must begin in the minds and hearts of all the nations, all the people, all the tongues. And so he waited to a, a particular time where there was quite a few people gathered from all around the earth to hear about this new this is that. Your sons and daughters, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Upon your handmaids and your, upon your maidservants will I pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So therefore, the Holy Spirit as we know it from the biblical text, comes upon all flesh, all nations, all kindreds, all people. So therefore, not only is the gospel multi-ethnic, it's inter-ethnic. So Christ died for all of us. But within that context then, I believe that if Christ died for all of us, but yet he created us in his own image, but we celebrate him also in various tongues and nations and kindreds and people that I believe God is also uh, concerned about the ethnicity of those that he has called to worship. When I look like, when I look at a bowl of fruit, I see apples and oranges and peaches and grapes and, and bananas. Just think about fruit. We say fruit. How do you discriminate against fruit? Fruit. What you say when you say fruit, normally you say what kind of a fruit? What kind do you want? Well, I'm going to the fruit market. Bring me back some fruit. You say, well, what kind? 
Did you not know that all the fruit, the varieties of fruits in the fruit family are grown in different climates? Some in similar climates, some in different soils, some in different parts of the land and certain elevations, but they produce after their kind because they have been grown. And then we have the mixed fruit. We have the kiwi, the kiwi, which is a mix of what? The strawberry and the watermelon. We have a mixed fruit and fruit. And then at the same time, we have when we say a bouquet of flowers. I like flowers, but do you know when you get that bouquet of flowers, somebody give you a bouquet? of flowers it's not just a whole bouquet of roses but there are flowers that some of those flowers are grown in different locations and they had to celebrate the the isness typing of what they needed in order to produce who and what kind of a flower it was so that when you put it all together that it would be a bouquet of flowers when you put it all together it would be a bowl of fruit grapes are grown differently from bananas and different climates, but yet they still have to have the sun and the wind and others to cultivate. So I was thinking about that as we are called, every nation, every kindred, and every tongue is going to give God praise. I wonder what that's going to look like. I wonder what that looks like. But in order for it to look like the nations, plural, I believe that each nation has to celebrate itself and what it does and what makes it a nation. We're all a humanity. I mean, if somebody needs a kidney, they don't say, are you Hispanic or Mexican or black or white or whatever? You know, they want to know your body type. So when it comes down to God coming in and touching us and healing us and equipping us, he is a concern about who we are and our body, soul, and spirit. But also, there are certain things and aspects that affects us, that influence us, the way we think, the way we serve, and the way we participate. And so in keeping with that, I, I wanted to take a time out to celebrate. I wanted to take the time out to celebrate as an African-American male in this season, being 67 years old, born and raised by two black parents, father from Augusta, Georgia, from the South, mother come from Waco, Texas, by way of California, met in Chicago some years ago, 68 years ago, married, uh, met and married, and I'm the first of 14 children. So my heritage comes, I find myself in heritage of being the son of uh, those that on my mother's side that were uh, from the slave owners that picked cotton in the South in Texas. They tells me their story, a little mix. I got a little mix in me of, of, of American, uh, American Indian. And uh, some of us, we have different uh, Caucasian mixtures. We, we're, we're mixed with different types of blood, but yet our skin color, for some reason, sometimes puts us in categories. If we would do a, a study of our ethnicity and our background, we'll probably find out that we're a little this, a little this, a little that, a little bit of this, a certain percentage of that, a certain percentage of this. But in the same time, within the Western civilization in America, because of however this mixture has has come to be if you if your skin color typing is more negroid or africanoid and you fit into what the box says you're an african american then uh, your treatment has been different historically it's just a given even though we love all people so i begin to think about in the black community in our communities our treatment is different. Some of our issues are somewhat similar, but somewhat different and unique in certain areas depending upon the class system that we are part of because in our, in our um, system, we, we are di at different levels. Do we have different structures? I was looking and reading from the book on the evangelicals and one of my good friends and brothers, uh, Dr. William H. Bentley, who was one of my mentors, he talks about the fact that we have come, even though that we, we have different experiences, that uh, at the same time, 
the consolidation of our experiences, uh, our psychological, our political, our sociological jargon is a little different in certain areas. And so therefore, we, we might uh, have different issues and different lifestyles, but some of us, if we're African Americans, there's just certain isness that we have to go through. Our history tells us. And so I wanted to take a little time and, and, and just celebrate that because one of the things that I've been concerned about is how we have been treating what we call the church. The church. The church is the body of Christ, but in the body of Christ, the spirit of God, there's, we know as one spirit, one God, one faith, but yet out of that we all in our faith, we also are different ethnos 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 because of our looks uh, uh, we've been handled different different people look in different ways are handled different kinds of ways even as I look now in our current situation with the president saying he he wants to build a wall and uh, it started out with Mexico gonna build a wall and it started out looking at Mexicans and Hispanics, but they, when you say Hispania, you got to deal with different types of Hispanics, different types of looks. So when you say Mexican, uh, Cuban, Honduras, Honduras, uh, Venezuela, you know, after after a while, people have a way of putting people in certain body types. They they look a certain kind of a way. Well, he Hispanic. Well, why are you? How is he Hispanic? Well, you know, look at his hair. Look at his features. We, he's African American. How is that? Well, look at, you know, so we have a tendency in our world, regardless, regardless to sort of put people in categories based upon how they look, based upon their accent, based upon the, the country they come from or whatever. And because of that, that is a reality. Historically, has always been there. And so one of the things that I wanted to take time out to talk about was the African-American in America and our history of how we're called to celebrate what God has been doing in us, by us, because of us. What has God done? How has God kept us? What are some of the things in our history that helps us as a people to begin to really say we know God and our God is an awesome God. He's everybody's God, but he also as he has done with the nations and peoples of the world, he's the same God. Uh, and, I, and one of the major, major songs that our good spiritual father in Chicago, uh, Dr. Clay Evans, you know, he always would love that song. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do it for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that, to know that what he's done for others, he could do for me. He could do for you, regardless of your ethnicity. He can, do whatever he's done, he can do it for others. But I wanted to take a time out because as I began to look at our situations in the land and we're in Chicago and people talking about all the issues in Chicago but as I travel and I stop at the hotels and I and I go into the hotels and I turn on the news I'm like well somebody got shot over here in this in this city somebody is missing over at this city somebody was over here so some of the evils in our world is also germane to all other places, all other places, all other places. So we can sum up the statistics by saying one place is more sensitive to things and more one place has a, a, a situation where it's more crime here and then more crime there. More, but still crime is crime. And no matter where you travel, no matter where you go, if you watch and listen to the news long enough, you'll hear some of the same issues that you would say, wow, I just left my home, I just left the area that I live in, and I can mirror some of this same stuff on the news. So I begin to understand that. And what I want to say specifically to our people and my African-American people and those of you that are listening from other ethnos and ethnic groups, I'm asking you to pray for us as we pray for you. 
The church is the body of Christ. Yes, God does not distinguish, but God loves all of his ethnic groups. And I think that we need to pray for one another and pray for each other and intercede for each other, not only beyond just your member of the body of Christ, but also that we need to pray and intercede for each other and one another as members of nations or as members of ethnos. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every ethnos, to every creature, to every nation, to all nations. All nations, kindreds and tongues shall be gathered at the feast. But in the meantime, we need to be sensitive to pray for the body of Christ, the universal church, as it is exemplified through the variety of ethnos, cultures, people, and geographical areas. So I want to take a moment and share with my other brothers and sisters of different ethnicities just from the African-American perspective of why I say that and why I'm asking you to pray for us and stand with us as we also become aware of your history and stand with you. Certain things that we have and have experiences because of who we were, because of who we were in America. So we have to deal with the reality and the historical dimensions of truth. For some reason, we're in a time where people have a tendency to distort the truth for their own benefits. We see that in our politics. We see that in our churches. We see that in our families, among our friends, how it's so easy to distort the truth or push over the truth or ignore the truth for, well, we just, everybody loved the Lord. We don't believe, no, 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 no. We have to also understand the truth. You shall know the truth. What is the truth? One of the things that really challenge me when I read the biblical texts and those of us who are Bible believing believers we know in the Old Testament God spoke to a specific group of people they were in slavery for 400 years and God brought them out through the Red Sea into the wilderness and then to the promised land but he said to them I need you to tell it to your children Tell it to your children's children. This is our commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul, all thy strength, and thy neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Those who are in need and also other ethnic groups as thyself. But look at what God has done for you as a people. Look what you went through. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it to your children. Put it on the doorpost. Keep it up before you so therefore you remember God now you notice in the Old Testament anytime the children of Israel got caught up they their oppressors oppressed them and they were going through for those of you that are biblical students if you read the book of jo of judges you know they did what was evil against the Lord they went against the Lord and God let other rose up certain people to oppress them then they cried unto the Lord and the Lord heard them and delivered them out then as long as the people that cried unto the Lord were obedient to God and taught and shared as long as they was around and alive they had peace but then when they died off there rose up people who do know, knew not the Lord how do we get a generation of people that knows not the Lord how does that happen how does a generation rise up not knowing the Lord that is an indictment on the previous generations you know when I look at this whole generational thing I I really say to people you know what you need to begin to understand that God has blessed you and equipped you that each one of you that are watching me today I want to challenge you to think about it you ought to see yourself and what you do and how you disciple and how you relate to yourselves and others relating to five generations. You should be relating to five generations of people at one time. All of you, your, 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 your relationships, how you come and go should almost touch five generations. Let's look at, let's look at, let's take me for an example. Apostle Brinson, I'm, I'm 67 years old. Okay, so I would be what they call the baby boomers. I'm in the baby boomers, the beginning of the baby boomers, 67 years old. But then I have parents in their 80s. So 
I have parents in their 80s. So in my age grouping and my generation, my generation that have parents that are alive are relating to a generation that is before them. So therefore, at the age of 67 years old, I still have a relationship of influence and relationships with people in their 80s and 90s. Right? Of course. Of course. Okay. So people, you got parents that are in their 80s and 90s. That's a generation. So you should be able to uh, affect, interrelate, and share with that generation that's above you. So that would be my generation above me. So that's one generation. My generation is two generations. Now, the next generation would be my children. Depending upon how life is, some people start having children at 16, 17, 18. Some people don't have children until they're 30 and 40. Well, let's say 18 to 21, you're having a children. So at my age of 67, I have a son. My oldest son is 41. I have a 41-year-old son. My oldest son is 41. My middle son is 37. And my daughter is 35. So I should be able to talk and share with that generation. My 41-year-old son's, his generation, so all of those people by me being 67 that are 38, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, I should be able to relate to them. They should be able to relate to me. We should be able to affect each other's lives. So that's three generations. Three generations. That's three generations. Now, my 41-year-old son, based upon when he got married or based upon when he had children at 41, is, is, isn't it possible at 41 for him to have a son or a daughter that's 20? I know some 35 and 36 and 37, 38 year olds are saying, 38 years old saying, wow, I'm so happy. My daughter's 18. My son is 18. They just in their first year of college. So for me, that would be a grandchild, a 20 year old grandchild. Is that too hard for me to have a 20 year old grandchild at 67? So that's four generations right there four generations so shouldn't I be able to talk and share and empower and impact our grandchild which will be the fourth generation that's why you know for some time I have a concern with us baby boomers talking about the millennials Lee, the millennials should be your grandchildren the millennials if you're a baby boomer that's your grandchildren Generational X's are your children. So I don't understand how we as baby boomers got issues with the millennials and don't understand their culture. And they don't understand us. Come on now. So we need to, that's four generations. So could not my 20 year old grandchild at 20 years old, which is the fourth generation that I impact, my parents, first generation, people in my age, Second generation, people in my son age 40 in that age group, third generation, my grandchild, a daughter, son, a daughter, which is 20, fourth generation. And could they not have one on the way? I got another great grandbaby coming on the way. They, nine, they 20 years old and got married or however they do. Now they got a one year old or a two year old at the house. So you mean at my age, I cannot be uh, some kind of way. I should be affecting my granddaughter, my grandson who is 20, who happened to have a child in, in our days and time. Wow, some of them at that age, yeah, two and three. So if you see that process, see what I mean? That's five generations. You have the capacity to touch five generations, whether those generations are of your blood that actually came out your womb or they're in the community at large. So for little babies, for the adolescents, the teenagers, the millennials, the baby boomers, the generational X's and all the other different groups that we call your life should matter in five generations. Those who are in their 80s, you just go down four. 
those who's 40, you you go down three and, and go, take yourself and go down two and then go up two. So what, what age group are you in? As you live and the longer you live, you should be able to, before God take you home, if you live a full life, uh, you should see yourself impacting five generations. The biblical text talks about visiting the iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, but showing mercy. Uh, that's the fifth generation gets mercy. It's almost like the fifth generation. Every fifth generation is a generation of called grace. And every fifth generation uh, gets a pass to start all over as a first generation. Ah, take that and think about that. Five generations. Every fifth generation starts over as one generation. That's almost like the, the year of Jubilee, 49 plus 5, 50, but the fives. So if we look at that then, my question that I'm laying out on the table is, how do we raise up a generation that knows not the Lord? Could it be that we didn't tell our history? Could it be that in all of our generations, we didn't come in contact with people who had a real experience with God? Could tell our story? Could it be that we didn't get discipled could it be that certain generations of people and families did not follow the text, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every, every nation, every people? Charity begins at home. Could it be that we didn't let our life shine at home before we went abroad? Even Paul says, if you're going to be a minister, you got to take care of your home base. So could it be that certain people didn't take care of their home base? How do we rise up a generation that knows not the Lord? That sounds something familiar, doesn't it? In the Old Testament, we had those kinds of people that when all those people died out, so they didn't hold held each generation, did not hold the next generation accountable. No matter how things change, no matter how people change, no matter how cultures change, no matter how traditions change and rules and regulations change and ordinances change, God is still God. So how do we grow and rise up a generation that knows not the Lord? Or how do we rise up and grow a generation that is not as strong and sensitive to past generations because somehow we did not uh, work in excellence to continue to tell the story? I wanted to take some time out today and I laid all that out to sort of try to deal with some of the inconsistencies and the circumstances that I find in, in the community of African Americans. Particularly in our communities, particularly as it relates to our spirituality, particularly as it relates to our worship, what we call our church. I know a lot of people want to say, well, you know, Brinson, there's no such thing as the black church. I wager to differ. There is a such a thing as a black church. You know what the black church is? The black church is a representative of black people having church wherever they have it. Black people having church wherever they have it. So you can have people of the black church sitting in white churches. Or oh, there's no white church. Yes, every ethnic group is a part of the body of Christ. And so when we talk about church, I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about the universal church. But also I'm talking about the local congregations where people come where people celebrate, where people participate. And normally, people have a tendency uh, when they look at getting into organizations or being a part of church, uh, they tend, and I have made some notes to myself uh, about that, but we tend to seek our membership in organizations among groups of people uh, which we identify with. Uh, socially, economically, and culturally in other ways as well. And so within those general terms are some specific situations. So I'm not really talking about because no matter what I say, you can always come up with an alternative. Well, Brinson, what about this case? What about that case? Well, I'm talking from a general perspective. Generally speaking, we need to look at that. And I want to take a time out because one of the things that I do realize is that, um, and I made some notes to myself, 
about that because when we talk about blacks and African Americans in the church, and I'm talking about the local church, the church universal, Christ church, but the local church, and within the local church, we have denominations. We have denominations, and we have groupings of people, and uh, we have different other denominations, and I, I was thinking about that for those of us who are Bible-believing people, basic doctrinal Bible-believing people. If we look at that from a holistic standpoint, basically Bible-believing people that have a biblical doctrinal system based upon the biblical texts are all over the world. They're all over the world. They come in different forms. They, they come in different ethnicities. They come from ge different geographical areas. They come from different cultural challenges. They come from different styles and way they worship and celebrate. And as we, we, we relate to them and become inter-ethnos, inter-interracial and, inter and multiracial, we sort of learn some of those ways and adopt some of those ways and borrow from some of those ways and attitudes. And yet the church still is the body of Christ. I understand that. That is not my argument. But at the same time, there's an ethnos, there's an ethnos, there's an ethnocentristic factor that belongs to certain groups of people because of their ethnicity or because of their tribe in humanity. Whether you're German or Swedish or Italian, you know, Jewish or Cuban or from Africa, but Africa is a continent, so whether you are uh, from Nairobi or from uh, Liberia or from Ghana, you're Ghanaian or, or, or you're from, uh, you know, different other parts of the world, you know, you're mid, mid Eastern or you're from Turkey or wherever. Within that context, we still love God. God works in us and through us. But some of us, because of where we are, who we are, our experiences, we have some uniquenesses that are different from other groups. Yet the whole challenge of humanity runs the same. When you cut, you bleed. Anger, all those other issues, thorns of the flesh and the, the works of the flesh, gifts of the body of Christ are the same they just manifest somewhat different in certain groups of people so when I begin to think about blacks in the black church I would have to qualify myself by saying there are blacks who love God within major and mainstream white churches major and mainstream white churches you find black people some of you all see them in the choir I don't know if they work on the board but you see them in different areas of the church they're in the mainstream white denomination. So if we look at some of the mainstream white denominations that have blacks in it, some of them have Hispanics in them, some have Cubans in them, some have Koreans in them. You know, they, you know, we talk about the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, the traditional reform groups, the Mennonites, the evangelical free and evangelical friends, uh, uh, the Pentecostal, the holiness and the fundamentalistic groups. All of those groups have people of color in them. In them. In them. They're, they're in. They're, they're there. We're not. We're talking about multi-ethnic ministries. We're talking about ministries at one time that were all, they, there weren't too many, but two or three. But, you know, most of our mainline white, quote unquote, white denominations in America now have within those denominations and eth ethnic groups. One of the groups is African Americans. Uh, some, of, some of the mainline denominations say they have a Chinese community congregation. Others say they have a Korean congregation. Others say, well, we have a Hispanic church that meets and we support them as well. So within the church universal is an understanding that there are different ethnic groups 
within the church in general but we're still yet all members of the body of Christ and there is no male or female no 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 male or female no bond nor free no Jew no Greek so there is no male or female sexism there 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 is no uh, Jew nor Greek racism there's neither bond nor free status classism so classism, sexism, and racism don't belong in the church. Yet it's in there because of our nature. Because we white, we war and fight against the lust of the flesh and all that's in the world. And sometimes we get caught up within the church and we mirror those things that are in the world. So we understand that uh, within the black church. Now within the black church, we, we're, we're a little peculiar. So if I say, when I say the black church, I want to talk about the black church in America right now because the African-American presence, I should say the African-American presence because for some reason when we say the black church, you know, people in London and others may not be African-American, but they are a black by color because we see race for some reason. So black, there are black people all over the world but they're not African American black, but they're black from Africa, or they may not. They were, you know, if you really study history, people of color was all over the world, and and I hate to challenge some of you all that the biblical text was written to people of color, that the Israelites, the Israelites and the Hebrews that you read about, and in, in Deuteronomy and Numbers. And all them folks, though, that was a mixed multitude of people of color. I hate to tell y'all that. I hate to tell y'all I had to mess y'all up. Jezebel was a person of color. I hate to tell y'all that. She was a Zidonian. All of the Philistines, the Philistines, the people from the land of Canaan, they were people of color. I had to tell y'all that. All those people in Egypt. When you talk about Egypt, you're talking about people of color. I had to tell you all that. Abraham and all the fathers if you really check them they were people of color but see back in those days there was no discrimination between color so that wasn't really not an issue or whether you was black or white you know for those of you that need to go study your history now you know one of the things I'm celebrating and I'm excited about is the internet I am so glad that we have the internet I am, you know who one of my best friends is? Google. One of our challenges, the biblical text said in the last days, people shall go to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. The world is much smaller now. And knowledge is out there. The real challenge for us is that almost anything you want to know, you can Google it. Anything you want to know about, if you dig enough, the information is out there whether you agree with it or not. Good information, bad information, half facts, true facts, and you got to deal. Just like right now with the with the border, you know, the president and other folks are saying these are our facts. So somebody writes that down, and 40 years from now they are gonna say these are facts. Then others say, no, no, that's not the real facts. They got the facts messed up. That no, we have the facts. So wherever the facts are, they're still facts. Good facts, bad facts. Good news, bad news. News. So how do I cipher through all the information, all the books, all the writings, all the evaluations of all the people, the anthropologists, the people who study culture, the agriculture, the people plant food, and those people that went in and looked up and dug up information and, and they put it in books. See, when we were coming up, when you went to school and were educated, you was told by the professor, these are the books you're going to read. And based upon these books, I'm going to give you a test. So the educational system, the Western educational system, and also the westernized church version of Western information and westernized religion didn't tell us about all the other religious uh, experiences of other Christians that were all over the world. So when we learned, those of us that went to Bible college or seminary or whatever, we were trained and studied in the westernized version of Christianity. We, 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 we reflect that through our leaders, through our, our people we study and write. 
we, those people we we don't have sometime a relationship with some people in our own culture. I, I you know, I, don't get me started when I start talking about the black church and the black community and black folks, even in our churches, in our black Christian Pentecostal full gospel apostolic churches. When we talk about how God used people, we some of us we we don't even have a historical understanding that God used some folk that look like us in great faith because we don't read no books. We 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 nobody told us. But oh, but we'll talk about Wigglesworth. We'll talk about God using Wigglesworth. We'll talk about Finney. We'll talk about D. L. Moody. Oh, we we'll talk about Shambach. We'll talk about A. A. Allen. We 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 we'll, 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 we know. Oh, we'll talk about how God used them. But some of us we don't know nothing about Black Harry, the itinerant United Methodist preacher. We, we don't know nothing about uh, uh, Allen, and we don't know too much about other African American people in our religious history as a church historically that God used that God used who, who what African American people in America that were leaders that God used tremendously do you know their names just like you know all the other names that you can call out we've been westernized there's nothing wrong with that our, the, the, our theologians and all of those things that we learn and the way we think has been westernized to the point that we we need now to begin to open ourselves to say you know God was doing some things in Africa he was doing some things in Turkey he was doing some things in India God was over in France he was over in Australia uh, who, who are the indigenous people of Australia it's not the people you see when you turn on the TV and see Australia. The indigenous people of Australia are people that look like me. Oh, oh. We we've been able to find out now that the now that thanks to Google, the or libraries that are open now, you can order books. Now the challenge for I'm gonna warn you, all kind of books are out there. All kind of books and people of color. The, the challenge for you is when you get the information, what do you do with it? How do you contextualize what you know? You can read some, but how do you understand it? Just like the eunuch was coming from Pentecost. He was coming from Jerusalem, riding a chariot, reading from the book of Isaiah. He was reading. He had a book of Isaiah. He was reading, but he didn't understand what he was reading. So evangelist Philip says, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I unless someone interpret? After he was uh, celebrated, gave his, Christ, his, his life to Christ and was baptized. That's all you read of scripture. He was baptized, but he was on his way back. Uh, to, eat, for, to He was on his way back because he was a member from Candace from, Candace, from Ethiopia. But if you do some study, you will find out that that same young man that was over the goods, that was riding in a chariot, that met Philip in the desert, that gave his life to Christ, went back home and started a Christian church. Where is that? Where? We started the Christian church. Most of us that understand the Christian church of Ethiopia, whatever, is Coptic. Now you drive down the city of Chicago and say, boy, that's a Coptic church, the true temple of Solomon. They wear black, they wear this. They ain't saved. They, you don't understand. What also, because you've been westernized to understand just the denominations from the Western standpoint, other people that worship and serve God. They may not talk the way you talk all the way. They're not a Christian. They're not believers. Oh boy, don't we have a lot to learn? So who are the Hebrews? Who are the Hebrews? Right now we've got the challenge of our Israelite, our Hebrew Israelite brethren. Did you not know? You see them walking around in our communities. They got the African thing and they say Judah. Where that come from? What? 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 They ain't say Brinson. Oh, wait! 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 Go back to scripture. You all remember when Judah was taken over? You remember when they went to Judah? They went to Judah and they burnt the temple down. 
and they destroyed the temple. Remember, they took some of the seed. Remember the story of Shackrock, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember Daniel and all of them that was of the royal seed that was taken into Babylon when they came down and destroyed Judah. But guess what? Did you not know that when they did that, they left a remnant in the land? They left a remnant in the land of Judah. And some of those, if you really studied and read it about Negroes and Hebrews in America, you will realize that when they say the lost tribes, but if you talk to an Israelite brother or sister, they're going to say, we ain't lost. We ain't never been lost. We knew who we were. We, we ain't lost. We here. But to other people, they lost. But look at it. So as they migrated north, don't forget Africa was a part of the Middle East. The Middle East didn't come to be the Middle East. What is that? That's something that we put together. But the land was still north in Africa, northern Africa. And so they migrated. Now, if you go back and look at the slave trade and study the, tra the slave trade, they talk about uh, uh, the Ivory Coast and the Port Judah. Port Judah is where supposedly, you know, we are African sold Africans. Africans fought Africans. Well, we fight each other now. We, you, Inglewood, we shoot each other down. If you go to Africa, the, this tribe is fighting that. The Hutus are fighting the Watas and whatever. So historically, we had uh, Africans uh, groups fighting each other and selling each other to slaves to the Portuguese and to the other slave traders. And they left from the Ivory Coast from Port Judah. Now, the Ivory Coast and Port Judah is part of the land where those Judites migrated and lived. So anybody that was taken on ships and made it through the passage from Port Judah would represent the Judites from Port Judah of the Ivory Coast that came to America. Those who ended up in America, some, you know, got dropped off in the West Indies and, you know, they say one ship got lost and ended up in Australia. That's how, you know, so any anybody that can trace their lineage to any of their grandparents back to slaves that came over the Middle Passage that came from Port Judah from the Ivory Coast would be remnants of the tribe of Judah. Isn't that so simple? Yeah, Hebrews. That's just a quick under. I, I don't have time, but that's just an overview. So between that and 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 black uh, blacks in the world, uh, if you study it. Those of those who have who are archaeologists have uncovered coins and stuff that when Paul wrote to the seven churches in Asia, that the leadership of those churches and those eras were people of color. You know how they did us. We they all, all got these pictures of Christ. Christ wasn't like that. He didn't look like that. That was somebody's pain. That was Michelangelo painting his cousin. So the picture of Jesus that you see all over the place is the popular culture painting him like that. So it was never an issue of black and white till recently. And, and then, you know, historically, depending upon what, 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 what year, you know, some of our church fathers were people of color. But let's get back to the African American community. I said, boy, I have to go, go through all this. So much I need to go through to get back to African Americans. For us, you all, our church helped us. Our church saved us. It was our sp the spirituality of the black church. From slavery, through the Civil War through our issues, through Jim Crow, where do you the white water fountain, the black water fountain, you couldn't eat in a restaurant and all of that kind of stuff. It was the black church where's where we went, where we knew God, where we celebrated God, where we sung our spirituals 
and our spirituals that had more than one meaning and our hymns and we we jumped and shouted whatever we believed in it helped us over our issues over our frustrations it was our worship of God our belief in God our understanding of scripture our taking the stories of Daniel and the lion's den and making it part of our lifestyles and interpreting the scriptures from our vantage point to see God at work with us as a people and so I wanted to pause for station identification and thank my hist and thank my relatives, thank my grandparents and my great grandparents and those people of color in the African American community in America that gave their lives, their time, and their soul to seek God, to know God, to worship God, that had a real experience with God, and to pass down those spiritual teachings down to us. That even now I can say I know God because my parents taught me God. And their parents taught God. If the parent didn't teach them, the community taught it. It was a community of faith. And I still celebrate. Guess what? That community of faith is live today. Even now. In spite of what you see. In spite of what you say. The church ain't this. The church ain't that. The preacher is this. The church ain't that. Guess what? The church is. That's from your vantage point. That's from where you sit. That's from where you see it. I need to broaden you to say the church is alive and well. The African American church is alive and well. We may be a mixed multitude. We may be in mainline denominations. We may be ethnos and other ethno groups. We may be multi-ethnic and multi this and multi that. But we're still a group in the flowers. We're still an orange in the in the in the fruit bowl. We've had experiences. Our people have had like experiences that somehow our God brought us out. Some God, somehow our God made a way. And so the biblical text is clear. It told the children of Israel, remove not the ancient landmark. Tell it to your children. Keep this history alive. And I challenge our African American people, regardless of what church you're in, regardless of your denomination, even if you are in a, a multi-ethnic church, you still don't you can be in a multi-ethnic church all you want to with your black self, your African American self. Go in a certain neighborhood, you'll wake up. Apply for a certain job, you will see. Try to get in certain things. We still have racism in our, in our culture. You know, we have racism is both covert and overt. Overt says just, I just don't like you. Get away. You're not allowed here. Covert is that sneakiness. But you know what? Our church, regardless of what we went through as a people, we made it. That's why I'm saying to our people of color, you, you, I, well, you know, why are you talking about Trump? Trump is just a man. He he the president. We he he so in our people, our spirituality tells us in spite of Trump, God makes a way. Because of Trump, God makes a way. Regardless of who's in our White House, God still made a way. He's the same God. So we need to go back into our neighborhoods, into our communities. We need to get our children, our grandchildren, and our people, and we need to sit them down and talk about our history. About God, 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 God. That's why I'm so glad when I hear the song God of our, we, we sing, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven rings, ring with the harm. But there's a, there's a verse that says, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far along our way, thou who has by thy might led us to this light, keep us forever in the past we speak. We pray lest we stray from the past Our God where we met thee Lest our hearts drunk, drunk with the wine of the world We forget thee Shadow beneath thy hand May we forever stand True to our God True to our native land God of our weary years Some of your grandmothers And grandfathers Go back to them Talk about God Say grandmama, granddaddy, millennials Look y'all look Baby boomers Go back Talk about God. Discuss him. Talk about what he done. There's no secret. Talk about, find you some seniors. Say, tell me about your God. Take that information and begin to share it with our children. 
God is a way maker. What do you, what do you mean? What way? Well, let me tell you. Because some people, they have never had that experience. Nobody never told them. They never shared. Or if they had it, they didn't even put it in context. We have to context it. So I have come today on this show to celebrate the history of the black church in America. I have come as a member of a minister and as an apostle in the lost church but yet at the same time who happened to be African American to say that I am a product of the black church in America we didn't argue you know you know Jim Crow we didn't you know before we said we pushed for our rights we have a right to go uh you know, I was laughing to myself now that we in the thank God for our social challenges. We have a right now to go in the restaurants and eat before they didn't want us in their restaurants. But you know what? In the black church long time ago, we weren't even in no restaurant. You know what the black church did for us? We had potluck church. We had we that's why black folk can eat so much we will always have family unions and potluck after church everybody went to so-and-so's house or after church everybody brought stuff we didn't have to go out to the restaurant and fight that i have to sit in the back and wait in a long line we had our own restaurants we cooked our food made our macaroni and cheese and fried our chicken and had our salads and our chitlins and and our greens and our cornbread we and we you know with no soul food restaurants we had our own soul food church people came together who who made the pie who 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 had the apple pie the peach cobbler the banana pudding we wasn't fighting to get in line to sit there no county eat no banana pudding because our church helped us but there was a time we need to fight to grow our leaders who we are today our schools our historical black colleges and universities our schools our institutions and all that we have as a people that belong to us originated out of us as a people and as a people our spirituality and our celebration of our God of coming together was church where two or three are gathered together in my name I am in the midst so I came to celebrate the black church and I come to thank the black church because regardless of what you say there's still a social reality we still got some places to go as a people but I thank God for allowing my parents my great grandparents you know when I talk to my dad on my father's side I find out that I come from a line of preachers and missionaries and some of you all need to come that wasn't in line but there's somebody taught you and uncle this and big mama that and spiritual this I thank God for all of those people those people that died and went on and those are still living that say I know God that's who I talk about so when I talk about the black church I'm talking about black people that are Bible believing that love Christ that are part of his church which so happen to be African American so the black church in America or the African American church we are as a people we have a God and we celebrate so when we talk about the black church, we're talking about black, and in the black church, we talked about them in mainline denominations, but we have black, and now we have black mainline denominations. We have black Christians within the white church structures. We have black Christians who are independent churches. We have black holiness and Pentecostals. We have uh, black fellowships associations. We have black reference uh we have churches and then we have uh uh this is my reformation we have church reformations and church alliances and we have the prophetic movements and the apostolic movements of people of color but yet at the same time we intermingle with the total church god is coming back for a total church not a black or white but all of us he's coming back for all of us but he wants us to be who we are based upon he made us if you are apple in the fruit basket, be the apple. Grow the apple, be a strong apple, but you can't be an apple running around learning how to be an orange. Be an apple so you can be with the oranges. Be a great. So I want to say to you today, thank you for your time. I want to continue to pray. Father, I thank you for our people. I thank you for our elders, African-American elders and people in our church, our leaders, our pastors, our bishops, all of our churches, wherever we are. God, continue to bless our churches. Help us to continue to share the light. Thank you, God. 
We celebrate who we are as a people, yet a part of a greater people, the universal church, but as also people of the black church or the African American church in America. Be blessed until we meet again is my prayer. God go with you and bless you.